Hi, welcome to a physionic detailed study analysis. Uh, today's study analysis is going to be a continuation in my investigation on how artificial sweeteners or non-nutritive sweeteners affect insulin resistance or insulin effect, glucose tolerance, things of that nature. Now, from the get-go, from the get-go, uh, I would like to mention that this particular study is going to be very much mechanistic in nature. So if you're going into this with the expectation of getting the answer of does sucralose or saccharin or acesulfame K, ACE K lead to insulin resistance, this is not the video for that. This is specifically to find out more information on the mechanisms. So how do these particular molecules, these non-nutritive sweeteners, once they interact with our cells, what happens within our cells? So this is going to be more cell and molecular biology focused. And I understand a lot of people aren't interested in that. And I totally get that. But as I'm branding physionic, uh, it's very much about going from the macro to the micro. And I, I focus a lot on the macro. I've been focused on the macro and we'll get more to the macro of does sucralose raise insulin levels? Does it affect insulin resistance? That's more of a macro question. And certainly I cover that as well in the big picture throughout my investigations. But I don't want to ever neglect the micro because what sets us apart, what sets Physionic apart is that we also go into the extreme detail of the mechanisms. And that's what really uh, gets me excited. So not just getting the answers, but also understanding the mechanisms. So I just wanted to add that as a disclaimer because um, I certainly understand that people might get to the end of this video if I don't add this disclaimer and then end up mentioning, well, how do I apply this? You're not going to apply this point blank. This video is one of many videos uh, in my investigation on the overall topic, but it's still a necessary one to get to the mechanism. So the very detailed section. All right. With that out of the way, however, that's what we're going to be covering. We're going to be covering how these three different uh, artificial sweeteners, these non-nutritive sweeteners, uh, how they lead to an insulin response in pancreatic cells. So a lot of the data that we're going to be looking at actually is in animal models. So again, another critique, of course, I understand is that, well, then this doesn't translate to humans. Well, I'll go ahead and tell you that uh, I've looked this up as well in, in the information I'll be providing you um, on the receptors and the cells and whatnot. They also occur in humans. Um, so just from the get go, I'll mention that. But the information that will be gleaning this information, the, the actual details of the data will be coming from animal models. Why? Because who's going to donate their pancreas while they're still alive? Uh, we can't do this kind of research in humans because, well, you'll die. Uh, I, 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 as a quick story, um, I had this comment under one of my videos where I mentioned, well, a lot of the research in fasting and the effect on autophagy uh, has been done in animals and I've been gleaning the, a lot of the information that uh, I've been covering from animals. Um, and then this person was like, well, this is pointless then. Like, why, why do we even bother? Like the, you're wasting my time. Right. Um, and I totally understand that frustration, but, uh, I think you have to understand from a scientific standpoint, from a research standpoint, um, autophagy in this example, autophagy is different based on the different systems that you study. So if you were to take a sample from the brain or the liver or the kidneys, autophagy may be induced the same way, but the particular mechanisms of how or how robustly or when it happens or what causes it, things like that are different from tissue to tissue. And so I ended up explaining this to this person and saying, uh, okay, well then if you'd like to donate a piece of your brain, if you'd like to donate a piece of your heart, your pancreas, your liver, your kidneys, your spleen, et cetera, et cetera, then I think researchers would be overjoyed to do the research on your tissues. Uh, however, 
and then this person ended up responding, oh, I thought it was just a blood test. It isn't. Uh, a lot of this research has to be done on the tissue, which is why we use animal models for a lot of the research. Now, of course, the translation needs to, there's a cautionary tale there, of course, that we can't necessarily translate it. That's why you have to look for other studies that try to get a translation aspect of the animal into humans. So I'm just adding these disclaimers because I often get comments from people just saying, well, why are we bothering with this? Well, you know, part of it is the brand. Part of it is my own excitement about what I'm doing. Um, the other thing is that I think the details really matter. And some of the details we can't get in humans. We will never be able to get it in humans. So we have to use uh, animal models and cell work and things of that nature. Okay. If you're confused by all of that, uh, you don't know who I am. My name is Nicholas Verhoeven. I'm a PhD candidate in molecular medicine. Uh, I uh, work in an autophagy laboratory uh, as a cell biology researcher. And with that, I think uh, let's go ahead and, and jump straight into it, straight into it after, you know, five, six minute uh, soliloquy on on the, the different research aspects. But, you know, let's let's just move on anyway. All right, so the topics that um, we're going to be covering are pretty simple. So one question that we're going to be answering is, do, does uh, sucralose, saccharin, and acesulfame K or ACE K produce an insulin response? This is going to be in uh, pancreatic cells. So the direct effect of these uh, non-nutritive sweeteners on beta cells, that which are the cells in our pancreas that produce insulin. So this is going to be uh, covered in this video. Now, if you're part, if you're watching the insider's version of this video, you'll also get a uh, specific intracellular mechanism. So what are the molecules that end up shifting within the cells to lead to this effect on an uh, in insulin response, if there is one, uh, which I'll go ahead and tell you there is one, but it's, it's a little bit nuanced. So if you want the full version covering both of these questions, then uh, certainly join my Physionic Insiders uh, community and you'll get access to this as well as all of my other study analyses and seminars and office hours and a bunch of other uh, great benefits that uh, hopefully will be of great use to you with uh, applicable takeaways and things of that nature. So uh, if you're interested, I'll add a ticker or add some sort of link for that and with that, if you're just interested in this question, in the public version, then let's jump into the content. So this information is going to be coming from this particular uh, study called Sweet Taste Receptor Expressed in Pancreatic Beta Cells Activates the Calcium and Cyclic AMP Signaling Systems and Stimulates Insulin Secretion. Bunch of words, uh, and I get that that can be a little confusing. We're going to break it down. So it's going to be a lot more understandable in just a little bit. But another thing that I've uh, vowed to myself based off of what people have also commented, which I think uh, to add greater clarity, to add greater uh, openness and honesty to the Physionic brand and whatnot, I've started mentioning who sponsored, who funded this research. So I wanted to go ahead and mention that this was uh, funded by a grant from the Ministry of Education in Japan. So this is public funding and uh, the funders had no role in the study design or the study in any way. And there were no conflicts of interest that were uh, offered up. So I just wanted to throw that out there uh, from the get go because as I said, I'm trying to always improve and tweak things uh, for the better. All right, so a bit on the education on how our cells activate, how they function, things of that nature. So here we've got a beta cell. So imagine that you've got your pancreas, you've got a body, a pancreas, and then if you were to zoom in, you would look, you would find these particular cells known as beta cells. These beta cells are the ones that end up secreting insulin. So here we've got the outside of the cell, here we've got the inside of the cell, and we've got our cell membrane, which separates the outside from the inside. Now embedded into that cell membrane, there's a receptor, which is known as a, a GPCR, which is a G protein coupled uh, receptor. And this 
receptor is a particular type of receptor. The reason why I mentioned the type of receptor is because it's important because of this section right here. Uh, it's technically in the generic sense called a G protein. A G protein is something that when, when a molecule binds to the outside of the receptor, so a small section that sticks out on the outside of the cell, when it binds to that section, there's a, a conformational change. So the, G, the, the receptor itself will, will shift in shape in such a way that this G protein will shift in shape as well, which will then attract a series of reactions that occur. So this G protein is uh, called, is a G alpha. So it's a gusta, gustadin or something, something along those lines, specifically for sweet taste receptors. So this receptor is a sweet taste receptor, which uh, will give us actually, this particular study is going to give us information not only on how it affects pancreatic cells, but may also affect intestinal cells and our mouthfeel cells, so the cells that uh, allow us to, to sense taste and sweetness and tartness and things of that nature. So this, uh, this has great translation to beyond just the beta cells, but in this situation, we're just focusing on the beta cells. So there's a shift in this uh, receptor, which then leads to a series of signaling molecules. And as we get further into this, uh, we're, especially for the insiders, we're going to get into a lot of those molecules, what interacts with what to lead to this uh, response in insulin. But ultimately, this uh, gustadin, I, th I think that's the correct uh, pronunciation, is a particular type of subunit or alpha uh, G protein. It's a, it's got a, a specific name, but generally this, uh, this subunit will then have this uh, shift and then you have all these other reactions. So to look at that a little bit deeper, to look at that in a little more uh, detailed with actually looking at the research itself. So what they've done here is they're using uh, min six cells. So min six cells are uh, mouse pancreatic cells and we're going to translate this to actual pancreatic tissue later on but for now we're focused on just mouse pancreatic cells and here we've got the same image i'm cutting it off a little bit with uh with the visual of me but it's the same exact image so you've got a non-nutritive sweetener let me remove myself for a second non-nutritive sweetener that binds to this uh, receptor we're not so much focused on the binding at the moment we'll look at that in just a little bit but we're very much interested in a really basic question <laughs> do these cells even express this receptor that's the question that we're trying to answer in with uh, this this data right now so we've got cells here we've got cells here and we've got a representation of the gene expression for particular genes so the gene expression so they're taking cells and they're looking at the gene expression within those cells and they're looking for specific genes. So they're looking at T1R2 and T1R3, and both of those are the sweet taste receptors. So this is the taste one receptor two, taste one receptor three. So the reason why there are two different ones is because much like many things in your body, you have redundancies and you also have just slightly different versions of the same thing. So you've kind of a, of a major class of something and then you have subclasses of it. So in this situation, you're talking about a sweet taste receptor, which is kind of the major class. And then you can have different, what are known as isoforms of that class. So different subclasses of the sweet taste receptor. So they're checking for both of these. So the two and three. And here in this image, what they're doing, so here they're looking at the, the actual gene expression. So the, the whiter, the lighter that it is, the more of it that you have. And here they're actually looking at the, the localization. So where is this sweet taste receptor uh, expressed? But we'll get to that in just a little bit. So here, looking at the gene expression, you can see that there's a good amount, there's a lot of this T1R2 gene that's being expressed if you look at how white it is by comparison to this one, which is a lot more dim. 
So there is some expression of T1R3, but it's not nearly as much from a genetic standpoint. And this is going to be super important because uh, as I get to this data right here, because there's a concept that I remember learning in my, um, at the beginning of my PhD, where they always, my, the professors would always say, well, just because there's gene expression doesn't necessarily mean that that's going to translate to protein expression, because this right here is a protein. So yes, you have gene expression that then gets uh, transcribed to RNA, so a kind of a middle form, and then from there, from RNA gets turned into or translated into protein. And then that protein then gets embedded into the cell membrane. So here we've got a lot of gene expression of T1R2, and we've got some gene expression of T1R3. Here they've got another gene expression of this particular uh, G alpha, so the gustadin, gustadidin, or whatever it's called, uh, the gustadin G protein, which is this subsection right here. So they're, they're measuring that as well, but we're m the most interested in these two right here. And then they've got this, what's known as a loading control uh, gap DH. Now, usually for gap DH, they would put it underneath. Um, I'm not entirely sure why they put it here. I would prefer it if they'd shown it down here for, for more technical reasons that I won't go into, but uh, they did add their loading control and it seems normal. Okay, so here we've got gene expression. The big takeaway here is that we have a lot of this of this particular t taste receptor uh, expressed, and we have a little bit of this taste receptor expressed. Now, here is a representation of this taste receptor, and here is a representation of this taste receptor. And the more the green is a fluorescent tag that's been tagged to this taste receptor or this taste receptor. The blue is uh, a dye or a fluorescent tag for the nucleus, so where the genes are kept. So we're not, in these images, we're not looking at the genetic expression though, we're looking at the protein levels of these uh, taste receptors and the localization, where it's located uh, in, in these cells. What we find is that there's a far dimmer, far lower amount of T1R2 versus compared to T1R3 if we were to compare those two. So this is a perfect illustration of while you have great amount of gene expression of this, when it comes to the full realization of that protein, something happens along the way where you don't get full expression of the protein or you get faster degradation of the protein, but ultimately that leads to lower levels of this T1R2 protein, although the gene expression is very high. On the other hand, you have some gene expression of T1R3, but the protein levels are much higher, meaning that you have maybe less degradation. Maybe you have a uh, greater synthesis of the protein just from the limited amount of gene expression. So maybe all of the gene expression is then translated into protein as opposed to the T1R2, maybe only 20% of that gene expression. So the RNA is created and then maybe 80% of it gets degraded, gets destroyed before it gets turned into protein and then maybe only the remaining 20% get turned into a protein, something along those lines. There's a number of plausible explanations, but the point is that in terms of protein level, it seems like T1R3 is far more prevalent than T1R2. But the big picture takeaway from this is that we have expression of the taste receptor. That's important. That's the main point that we're trying to get across here. I'm just getting a little bit uh, into the nerdy details. All right, so now to actually look at do these non-nutritive sweeteners affect insulin secretion. Now, I have a little bit of a critique uh, of this study in that this is kind of a poor display of a vertical axis or a y-axis uh, when displaying the data. So I don't actually know what this means and they don't really explain it in the study very well. Um, they've got insulin and then percent and it's 0 0.5 and then one, it's one of what? I don't know. Um, and if you're talking about percent, wouldn't it be a hundred instead of one or 
0.5 or whatever it might be. So I'm not a huge fan of how they displayed this. It's just a complete side note. But the big question here is that if the cells, so if these min sex six cells are uh, incubated in this non-nutritive sweetener, so the three that they're looking at is sucralose, saccharin, and uh, acesulfame K or ACE K, what happens to insulin secretion? Do these cells, do these beta cells then start to secrete insulin? So here we've got our control of just glucose at three millimolar. So what does that mean? That means that they're adding, they're just looking at the cells in a basal state with normal blood sugar levels or normal sugar levels since technically this isn't blood. But the cells that are on a dish have liquid around them, right? That's feeding them. And that liquid contains three millimolar of glucose. Now, how much is that? That's a standard amount of sugar. That would be like, uh, there would be non-diabetic levels of blood sugar if we were to translate this to humans, which obviously is difficult to do. So they've got this condition with three, 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 three. So in all four of these uh, conditions, they have let's say regular blood sugar or regular sugar levels. Now, on the other hand, here they've got extremely high. This is way beyond diabetic levels of sugar. And so they've got four here and four here with either normal or really high levels of sugar. And then they add each one of these individually. So in this situation, in the second one right here, they've got normal sugar levels plus sucralose that they've added to the media, to the liquid. Or they've got uh, saccharin that's added in the third condition, or they've got uh, ACE-K that's added. So <clears throat> really we're comparing these, so each one of these conditions against this control right here. And then for the same thing occurs here. So against this control right here. So this is without any of the uh, non-nutritive sweeteners added in this condition or in this condition. And what we find is that there's a little bit, you know, kind of a basal amount of insulin secretion with just the uh, glucose levels and with the three millimolar glucose levels. And then once they add sucralose, there is an increase in insulin secretion from these beta cells. Now, with saccharin, there's also an increase in the insulin secretion with uh, the, the addition of saccharin to these cells. And then ACE-K, we also see an increase. Now you might think, okay, well, there's a huge increase here. I'm not sure if they actually did statistics to compare between uh, these different conditions. So let's say sucralose versus ACE-K, but what we can definitely say is that ACE-K does lead to an increase in insulin secretion. Now, on the other hand, when we look at the really high glucose levels, we see probably if they were to compare statistically this, this condition versus this condition, they would see that this one is statistically significantly increased as well. But for the time being, they're not actually comparing those. So this is our control, and then we're comparing all these other conditions against this. So we're not comparing them against these. So what we find is that with sucralose in a really high sugar environment, there is no added increase in insulin secretion. However, with saccharin and ACE-K, we do see that added increase in insulin secretion. But the rest of the study ends up focusing a lot of its attention on this uh, sucralose. And really what's the most interesting, at least to me, is this effect right here, the, the effect with a lower or normal sugar level and the addition of these non-nutritive sweeteners. But overall, the big takeaway here is that most likely these non-nutritive sweeteners, at least at some dose, lead to an increase in insulin secretion from the beta cells. So the conclusion at the midpoint here is that non-nutritive sweeteners, so sucralose, saccharin, and acesulfame K, ACE-K, promote an insulin response from pancreatic cells. Now, one thing I should add here is, do these non-nutritive sweeteners even interact with pancreatic cells in a physiological system? And that is something that is not answered here because remember, they're isolating these beta cells from these animals and then adding the 
different non-nutritive sweeteners. So it's a direct effect. So yes, it does occur, but is it necessarily going to affect the pancreatic cells or is it going to affect uh, any sort of taste, any sort of cell that has these taste receptors? And that's where I think this study tells you more information. It tells you more information about a, does it have an effect? Does it actually interact with these, this particular receptor, which actually, if I were to go back here, really, in all reality, this information alone does not indicate that these non-nutritive sweeteners specifically interact with the receptor. They just tell us that the non-nutritive sweeteners interact with the cell as a whole and then lead to this increase in insulin secretion. They do not specifically tell us if there's an interaction with the receptor itself. For that, we need to keep going into the mechanisms and the molecular chemistry that occurs uh, within the cell. So if you're interested in what the mechanism is, looking even more detailed at these mechanisms, then uh, certainly jump onto the insider's version of uh, this video and you'll get access to all of it. So not just, uh, not just this study, but uh, also all of my other uh, study analyses that I've got out there as I continue to dive further and further into uh, the physiological effects, the actual human effects of these uh, different sweeteners on our insulin secretion and insulin resistance. So hopefully you learned something, hopefully you got something out of this. I, again, as I mentioned at the beginning, this is very much mechanistic. It's not gonna be a huge translation, but we will incorporate this into our understanding of how sweeteners uh, affect our blood sugar levels, glucose tolerance, uh, insulin levels, insulin resistance, sensitivity, et cetera, et cetera. All right, with that, I'll let you go and I'll hope to speak with you in the near future. Have a good one, bye.